On November 22nd, 1963, a stunned world looked on as President John F. Kennedy was shot dead by Lee Harvey Oswald. But remarkably, JFK's death at the hands of a lone assassin almost happened three years earlier. Today, a derelict house in the backwoods of New England is all that remains of a man who swore himself to the cause of killing Kennedy. He was a homicidal maniac. In the fall of 1960, in the weeks before JFK was sworn into office, he would stalk the president-elect across the country, looking for a suitable location to murder him. The weapon he would use would not be a marksman's rifle, but a car bomb. With never before heard witness testimony. He had told my husband that you probably won't see me again, but you'll hear of me. This is the little known story of one man's audacious plot to assassinate a president in a bid to go down in history as Kennedy's suicide bomber. Had he detonated it, we would have had a uh, dead president elect. Truth is stranger than fiction. <laughs> As America looked for a new president to succeed Eisenhower, few would have initially expected it would come from a candidate who opponents scorned as more of a playboy than a politician. But on July 13, 1960, John F. Kennedy won the Democratic nomination and began his bid for the presidency. I will be worthy of your trust. We will carry the fight to the people in the fall, and we shall win. The Democrats pitting the fresh-faced Kennedy against the Republicans' veteran Nixon signaled a new era for American politics. JFK symbolized youth. He symbolized new direction. He was glamorous. He was articulate. Um, and uh, the country, you know, just fell in love with him. But not everyone took the charismatic young leader to their hearts. John F. Kennedy's father, Joe, was a powerful and influential businessman. And there were rumblings in some quarters that he was attempting to buy the White House through backroom deals and brinksmanship. Joe Kennedy, the father, had made his money bootlegging with the mafia. He really sided with the Nazis and with Hitler, admired Hitler, uh, said democracy was finished, and that came out. So that didn't help JFK's image. Across the country, Pockets of Kennedy dissenters watched his campaign very closely. But maybe none more so than one resident of the tiny community of Belmont in New Hampshire. The town of Belmont is about uh, 35 square miles. There's some very plain houses where people just couldn't afford anything better. So it was a very much a mixed neighborhood, but certainly a residential neighborhood. On the outskirts of town, reclaimed by woodland, is a crumbling house, a last remnant of the life of one of Kennedy's greatest and perhaps one of his most dangerous detractors. Earl Sweeney was a young police sergeant back in 1960 and remembers the occupant of the house very well. He lived alone by himself. He, uh, I don't know if he was a widower or if he ever was married, uh, but he didn't, uh, you know, take great care of the house or anything. He was a medium height uh, gentleman. Uh, he had a very dour expression on his face. I never saw him smile. He always looked like he was frowning or unhappy about something. He had a big shock of white hair. The possessions that haunt the remains of the decaying home give little away 
they offer no real clues as to why in the fall of 1960, the occupant packed up and left. Hello, hey. can we come in? <laughs> Neighbors are still able to recall a secretive man who wanted prying eyes kept away. He kept to himself pretty much. He planted them all in that old stuff that's going around the lot over there. Yeah, all in picky like bushes. Oh, no, the picky, picky bushes. Yep. To keep us from going we'll through. To keep people from going through. The reclusive figure who lived in the house was 73-year-old Richard Pavlik. A retired postal worker Pavlik was a familiar face around town to Earl Sweeney, and he was known as a troublemaker with a bad temper. When I came on the police force, I became to know him as a rabble rouser, I guess you might call it, someone who was not happy with local government. He would go to town meeting. He would uh, always speak generally uh, against something. It was almost like a self-winding watch. The more he spoke, the more passionate he became. Pavlik's strong views on what he deemed to be rogue politics and politicians saw him turn his attention to John F. Kennedy in the spring of 1960. I would not run for it if in any way I didn't feel that I could do the job. I come here today saying that I think that this is an issue with John F. Pavlik was by now being very vocal around town about his contempt for Kennedy, and his violent temper was increasingly coming to the fore in daily life, giving the authorities cause for concern. On one occasion, he became angry at the local power company because they were going to shut off his, his electricity. He felt that uh, the power company was sending something through the wires that was harmful to, uh, to people who would affect their brains. He was very upset, shouting and uh, red in the face, and he was threatening he was going to shoot the uh, man from the power company. These kind of run-ins with the locals led to Pavlik's increased isolation from the community and society itself. By late August of 1960, Kennedy was still lagging behind Nixon in the polls. But all that was to change little more than a month later. On the 26th of September, the two men went head to head in their first televised debate. A discussion of issues in the current political campaign by the two major candidates for the presidency. Pavlik watched on as the young pretender outplayed Nixon in a confident and coherent display that overnight would see Kennedy turn the tables on his rival. If we're moving ahead, then I think freedom will be secure around the world. If we fail, then freedom fails. During the coming weeks, as Kennedy and Nixon continued to slug it out on television, Pavlik began venting his increasingly vitriolic views. Pope John XXIII formally announces the convocation of an ecumenical council. His concerns about any corruption stoked by Joe Kennedy were worsened by a hatred for Kennedy's Catholic faith and the church itself. He felt that if Kennedy was elected president that the Pope would be actually running the country from Rome instead of the White House running it. Pavlik began to obsess over the election campaign gathering press clippings that he displayed on the wall of his home. Kennedy evoked a certain kind of deep hatred by a certain segment of the population who didn't just oppose his policies, but really kind of demonized him. Pavlik now believed he was duty bound to do something to stop Kennedy from taking control of the country. But few could ever have anticipated his plot or that he would use a symbol of the American dream, his beloved Buick, to create the ultimate nightmare, the death of a president. In the fall of 1960, John F. Kennedy was deep into his campaign against Nixon to win the race for the White House. And we shall win. 
But as Kennedy traveled the length and breadth of the country, bidding to win support, in the backwoods of New England, there was one man who would not be voting for him. Richard Pavlik had formed a personal vendetta against Kennedy, one that was about to take a very deadly turn. A reclusive man by nature, Pavlik had no friends. But perhaps because he had been a postal worker himself once, he made an unlikely if unwilling confidant for his darkest thoughts in the form of the town's postmaster, Mr. Thomas Murphy. He came into the post office quite often, and he always had something crazy to say or what he was going to do. Nobody could have predicted what was to come next, but as Kennedy's popularity grew, Pavlik began turning his heartfelt hatred for the man into a hard-cooked plan to prevent him from ever being sworn into office. Mr. Thomas Murphy, the postmaster, uh, asked if he could speak to me privately, and uh, he told me that when uh, John F. Kennedy first ran for president, that Mr. Pavlik became very upset. He had made, apparently, a couple of com comments that if he gets elected, somebody should shoot the bastard. A hotly contested election campaign closes with Senator John F. Kennedy the choice of his countrymen as the 34th President of the United States. On November 8, 1960, Kennedy clinched a hard-fought victory. An enraged Pavlik was about to turn empty threats into something more deadly. Well, the last time he went into the post office, he said, you probably won't see me again, but you'll hear of me. But despite owning a firearm, Pavlik wasn't intending to shoot Kennedy. He had more explosive plans. Pavlik went to a hardware store and purchased dynamite, detonation cord, a trigger switch, a battery, and exploding caps. He was building a bomb. But it was his beloved Buick that formed the centerpiece of his master plan. Pavlik was a First World War Army veteran and had experimented with dynamite both in his backyard and on an empty lot in Florida. Pavlik rigged the trunk of the Buick with a handful of sticks of grade two dynamite used in the construction and mining industry. Pavlik very much meets the prototype of what we consider as a suicide bomber. The dynamite had blasting caps attached to them that were fused with copper wire and attached to a battery. It's very clear that um, from the outset he wanted to kill himself. He then drilled holes in the rear wheel wells of the Buick. The intent of the bombing itself is to evoke some sort of political change. Through these, he threaded the detonating cord which was attached via the blasting caps to the dynamite. The wire was long enough to reach the passenger seat where it was attached to a detonation switch. With the car now a mobile bomb, all Pavlik had to do was find the right moment to drive at Kennedy detonate the device and send himself down in history as the man who murdered a president. For an individual who typically hasn't engaged in terrorist attacks before, that takes a great deal of rationality to be able to plan, strategize, and ultimately take part in a solo terrorist attack. With his car bomb built, Pavlik was now ready to hit the road and hunt Kennedy down. He left town rather abruptly in his old Buick. That would be the last time many of the residents of Belmont would ever see him. Hordes of people turned out to celebrate wherever Kennedy went. But hidden among the crowds on many occasions was the shambling figure of Pavlik, who watched every move the president-elect made. News reports kept him informed of Kennedy's movements. And over the next 10 days, 
he clocked up over 1,500 miles in his car keeping up with him. With the Buick packed with dynamite, Pavlik was looking for a suitable place to attack Kennedy, who at times made himself an easy target. Running into crowds and riding in an open-top car uh, made Kennedy fairly uh, vulnerable. When you're out on the, uh, the campaign trail, uh, they have to get out and shake hands and uh, hug babies, and uh, we were always concerned. It was just something that we had to adapt to. At this stage, Pavlik was still not on the radar of the authorities as posing a lethal threat to Kennedy, but that was to change. And all because he couldn't resist maintaining contact with his old friend, Thomas Murphy. Pavlik sent the postmaster a postcard from every pit stop he made. On reading them, Murphy began fearing the worst. I am to enter my rope. Here I die someplace in Florida. You'll read about it perhaps within three weeks. I came down to die. You will see it on TV. The quiet and unassuming Mr. Murphy could not have realized just how he chose to react now to Pavlik's rambling postcards could mean the difference between life and death for John F. Kennedy. With his Buick primed as a car bomb, in the 10 days since leaving his hometown of Belmont, Pavlik had been looking for an opportunity to launch his suicide attack against Kennedy. But stalking the president-elect on his celebration trail was proving to be a frustrating experience. Kennedy was constantly on the move and never in the same place twice, meaning Pavlik couldn't lock his target down. But all that changed when JFK arrived in the wealthy enclave of Palm Beach, Florida for a vacation. Joe Kennedy, the father, and Rose Kennedy had had a home on Palm Beach, and JFK would visit. And uh, during his presidency, that was considered the Florida White House. But what Pavlik had in mind would turn this playground of the rich and famous into a graveyard. Pavlik had made his base at a motel a few miles from where the Kennedys lived. On the morning of December 11th, he awoke early to write one final farewell postcard to Thomas Murphy. Getting into his car, he headed straight to the Kennedys' home on North Ocean Boulevard. Parking outside, he waited and watched. Kennedy was readying the family for church. For the first time, Pavlik's quarry was in his range. All JFK had to do now was step outside the door. But the battered Buick drew the unwanted attention of Special Agent Ed Tucker. He had parked his car up about two or 300 yards from the main entrance into the Kennedy uh, property in Palm Beach. I mentioned it to another agent. I said, that car has been up there for quite a while. So we advised the Florida State Police detail and the Palm Beach Police Department that we were suspicious of this car. Previously classified documents suggest Pavlik had a change of heart. When he saw Jackie and the baby, Carolyn, allegedly, he decided not to do it there. Jerry Blaine, who was part of the Secret Service detail at the time, is certain that Pavlik could have succeeded. Had he not had a, uh, a change of heart and detonated it, uh, there was little we could have done. We would have had a uh, dead president elect. 
Either because he was spooked or changed his mind, Pavlik fled the scene. Returning to his motel, he waited for a few hours. At 10 a.m., he once again left. His destination this time was the Church of St. Edward on North County Road, where he knew Kennedy would be attending mass. The Secret Service files from the period reveal that Pavlik surveyed the street and the building. He thought Kennedy was vulnerable to a strike the moment he entered or exited the church. The Buick pulled up outside the church just before the start of midday mass. The car was still primed with explosives, but there was no sign of Kennedy, who was already inside taking his seat. Pavlik now found himself unable to just sit in the car and wait. In a chilling turn of events, he decided to go inside the church to get a good look at the president-elect. This elderly gentleman came in disheveled, and it was clear he wanted to be near the president. It was a matter of me going up and uh, grabbing him by the elbow. And I said, I think you'll find uh, a seats in the back. And he turned around and walked to the exit. So I took down the uh, license plate and he drove away. With his cover blown again, Pavlik fled the scene. He retired to his motel room for the next few days where once again, he put pen to paper. It wasn't long before 1,500 miles away in Belmont, Thomas Murphy received a new flurry of postcards from Pavlik. The tone was even more violent and volatile than usual. The sole source of his vitriol, John F. Kennedy. Watch the papers and radio for what would have been done to you. You should change your moronic attitude. Someone will take you over some hot coals and do a job on you. But it won't be me, for I would have done it and should have. He didn't know whether to turn him in or not, but he decided maybe he better. The postmaster said, I think he's following the president around and he may intend some harm. He said on several occasions, yeah, watch the news because you're gonna be hearing from me in a big way soon. He and I decided that I would report it to my chief and, and the sheriff and I, because we were all working together on it, uh, that we would also report it to the Secret Service. Robert Rust was an assistant district attorney in Palm Beach at the time. And along with his colleague, John Marshall, was alerted to the situation by a cable that was sent to all justice departments in the region. John took the steps of notifying every police department to be on the lookout for Richard Paul Pavlik. Pavlik was now a marked man and his Buick the most sought after car in the state. The uh, FBI office decided that this met the standard to uh, submit a, a so-called stop and hold order on him. When Pavlik ventured out of the motel the next day, he had no idea that every cop in town was on the lookout for his Buick with New Hampshire license plates. Leaving his motel, he drove over the bridge into Palm Beach, once again heading to the area where Kennedy was vacationing. Having crossed the bridge, however, he was forced to slow to a halt. A motorcycle cop was on his tail and flagged him down. Lester Free arrested Pavlik on one of the bridges from West Palm Beach to Palm Beach. Pavlik's rambling written threats and speculation that this elderly man was in town to kill JFK were not enough to throw the book at him. Robert Rust was now responsible for finding a charge to detain Pavlik under, so the alleged threat could be investigated further. Pavlik had mentioned during an interview a vague comment about dynamite, which he subsequently withdrew. 
Rust knew the threats to Kennedy's life already made to the postmaster. Could it be that Pavlik planned to blow the president up? Rust and his colleague John Marshall now set out to discover whether Pavlik had bought explosives back in Belmont. We were both asking these hardware stores and lumber yards if they'd sold any dynamite to Richard Paul Pavlik. On the 37th call, somebody said, oh yeah, he was in here two, three weeks ago. We sold him 10 sticks of dynamite, copper wire, a battery, a switch, and electronic detonators. I turned to John and I said, this son of a bitch is the real deal. But despite coming up with this information, Rust still faced a major problem. Unbelievably, at the time, there was no law in place against threatening the life of the president-elect. This meant Rust had to use every ounce of his legal ingenuity to cook up a charge that would stick. And it came from an unlikely source. When there were the Ku Klux Klan bombings of black churches in the South, and they created a misdemeanor that said that it was a criminal offense to blow up a church. Rust's legal legwork meant that Pavlik was charged with intent to destroy the Church of St. Edward. This paved the way for a warrant to search Pavlik's car and motel. Rust was convinced he would find incriminating evidence that would force Pavlik into a confession. We searched the car, the dynamite's in the trunk, the copper wire goes to the front seat, there's a switch in the front seat. All he's got to do is push the switch down and the dynamite blows up over the gas tank. So now we have not just 10 sticks of dynamite, we have napalm. This is the dynamite, the battery, the copper wire. This is certainly one of the uh, original world's car bombs, which would be enough to wipe out not only the people in the church, but the church itself. The discovery of the dynamite and the way it was rigged meant that Pavlik was now charged with being in possession of a deadly weapon, but he still refused to confess to anything. Rust now had to look for further incriminating evidence. With a search warrant in hand, he took Pavlik back to his motel room. As the search of the room began, Russ could sense they might be onto something, although even the smart young assistant DA didn't see what was coming next. I get down on my hands and knees, pull a suitcase out from underneath the bed, and I'll be damned. I open it up, and here is the last will and testament of Richard Paul Pavlik describing exactly how he was going to kill Kennedy. Wow! Dynamite! There it is! The whole nine yards! I turned to Pavlik and I said, you really did come down here to kill John F. Kennedy, didn't you? And he says, yes, I did. Very proudly. This startling discovery was the compelling piece of evidence that Rust needed to charge Pavlik. To the citizens of the United States of America, I am not the vicious person as my actions may have indicated. There should be only one law for all, not a religion made by the Catholic Church. Now that the presidency was sold to the Kennedys, they must be stopped by any and all means possible. If my actions have caused the decease of the president-elect, then a better qualified and experienced man will have to take over. 
It's a functional madman committed to a cause. Pavlik may have written what he believed to be a deathbed confession, but over 50 years later, one big question remains. If he had pressed the trigger, would Richard Pavlik and not Lee Harvey Oswald have gone down in history as the man who killed JFK? The discovery that Pavlik's Buick was rigged as a bomb, as well as his written confession, saw him placed under lock and key. The judge orders the prisoners sent to the federal prison hospital in Springfield, Missouri. At the time, speculation circulated that had he detonated the bomb, he would have gone down in history as the man who killed JFK. Since his plot was foiled before he could strike, it remained pure speculation. But today, over 50 years later, a remarkable experiment is about to take place that may shed new light on this dark chapter of history. At the Center for Ordnance Science and Technology Testing Ground in Wiltshire, England, explosive experts are hard at work. A Buick, identical to Pavlik's, is about to be turned into a car bomb. Explosives expert Trevor Lawrence, a veteran of conflicts in Serbia, Iraq, and Afghanistan, knows firsthand the damage suicide bombers can cause. The advantage of a car over a person carrying a bomb, obviously you can much, much larger charge and you can hide the charge a lot easier. And the damage they can cause, absolutely massive. You can get it exactly to the optimum point, huge structural damage and, and mass casualties. While the type of dynamite Pavlik purchased is no longer manufactured, Trevor has sourced a modern day equivalent. The actual explosive he used was a dynamite, a commercially available blasting explosive. What we're going to do is use a very, very similar explosive to that. It's nitroglycerine based, the same as the explosive that he used, um, and again, it's a blasting explosive. Trevor places the primed explosives in the trunk. The experiment will attempt to simulate what would have happened if Pavlik had put his plan into play outside the Church of St. Edward. Driving toward the church, when Kennedy was leaving and walking down the steps, Pavlik would have driven straight at him. When he was as close as he possibly could be, he would have detonated the device. from the steering wheel to the switch. As the smoke and debris clears, the experiment delivers a surprising result. The mannequins are still standing. But why? Suicide bombers usually drive straight at their targets. But the Buick engine block was so solid that it would have absorbed the majority of the energy from the blast. So you can clearly see here, that's where the explosives were positioned, and that's the actual seat of the explosion. And it's torn away. All this light superstructure has been thrown enormous distances. But if you look at the front, the actual engine block is all still in one piece. And that's not only deflected the blast, but it stopped anything forward from being torn off. So no major fragmentation has gone forward. This could have meant that JFK and any Secret Service personnel around him 
would have only had to protect themselves from relatively small pieces of debris. Watch the explosion again. You can clearly see that because the explosives were in the trunk of the car, heavy-duty shrapnel such as the doors and the side panels are only thrown upward or outward, but significantly not in front of the engine block. This meant the mannequins were left standing, and the president, if he'd been in their place, may well have survived. If he'd positioned it a bit further forward, so the charge had been more adjacent to where they were, absolutely no chance for them. I mean, they were purely by luck, stood in exactly the right place. But all is not quite as it seems. Even without being hit by shrapnel, JFK could have faced mortal jeopardy from the blast. Watch the explosion again. This rippling effect on the image is a shockwave from the blast. This is known as blast overpressure. And depending on how close you are standing to the point of detonation, it can prove to be fatal. They don't appear to have been struck by any of the fragments, but there's going to be an enormous amount of overpressure. That does a lot of damage to the human body. The power of the shockwave diminishes the further you are away from the car. But scientific calculations carried out by Trevor suggest that there was a 50% chance that JFK would have sustained lethal blast damage. It's going to enter the body orifices. It's going to blow out their eardrums. May have suffered internal damage, lung damage, internal bleeding. And you also have this phenomenon called blast lung, where uh, the blast overpressure enters the body and damages the, the, the alveoli in the lung. And what happens over time, they start to, to produce fluid, and you, you basically internally drown. Um, and quite often, people have walked away from explosions that seem to be OK, and hours later have died simply from fluid collecting in their lungs. But the only person certain to have perished would have been Pavlik himself. Not such a happy tale for him. He was right in the, in the force of the blast, and there are various bits of him scattered around here, which is kind of what would have happened in real life. Kennedy was sworn into office on January 20th, 1961. If Pavlik had succeeded with his bomb plot, it would have been his name, not Lee Harvey Oswald that would have gone down in history as Kennedy's killer. So why isn't Pavlik's story better known? I've been waiting years for somebody to come ask me. I've never been interviewed by anybody. Back in 1960, Robert Rust was the assistant district attorney who brought the original charges against Pavlik. He thinks he knows why the story isn't more widely known. John F. Kennedy and the Secret Service were very worried about a copycat so they wanted to soft pedal any publicity about this. That they don't want to describe the effort in full for fear that copycats will weeks or months later commit the same crime successfully. Added to this, the New York air disaster, where two planes collided over the city, took place on the day of Pavlik's arrest keeping him off most of the front pages. Two airliners collided and fell on New York City in the worst air disaster of all time. It took the greatest disaster force ever assembled in New York to conquer the blaze. Even with his bomb plot foiled and all but lost to history, the story of Richard Pavlik was far from over. And in the years to follow, it would bring strange and surprising turns. Pavlik's audacious plot to kill Kennedy with a car bomb may have been covered up by the White House, but the man himself remained troublesome for the administration, in no small part because he was constantly proclaiming his innocence, despite the evidence stacked against him. With his mental competency in question, a series of court hearings saw Pavlik shifted between mental hospitals and jailhouses. He, at times, was declared insane. At times, he was declared competent. The witnesses to his supposed statements were not cross-examined. That's a kind of torture. I mean, he seems to have entered this kind of purgatorial limbo where no one would take responsibility for any definitive judgment. For the next few years, Pavlik became lost in the system.
But in yet another strange twist to his story, it was the actual assassination of JFK on November 22nd, 1963, that set him on the path to freedom. At the request of the Secret Service, Pavlik was interviewed by a doctor to gauge his response to the news. He didn't infer any notable reaction, and certainly nothing to suggest that he was glad the president was dead. This proved to be a turning point. Pavlik was no longer deemed to be such a danger, and he was moved to the New Hampshire Mental Hospital in his home state. Perhaps buoyed by being back on home turf, Pavlik became a prolific man of words, writing letters to everyone and anyone who might be able to make him a free man. He wrote 18,000, 28,000 letters over this period. This is my last letter asking for you all to fight to get me a lawyer. I did not threaten Kennedy. If I had wanted to kill Kennedy, why did I let a good chance go by? You now have my life in your hands. It wasn't long before he got the ear of William Loeb, the publisher of the Manchester Union Leader. Loeb was a close friend of Jimmy Hoffa. Hoffa was boss of the powerful Teamster Union, a divisive character. He was no lover of the Kennedy cause, and he saw taking on Pavlik's case, as well as paying his legal fees, as a way of smearing the Kennedy name. John Marshall tells me that Jimmy Hoffa has arranged to hire the lawyers to try and get Pavlik out of the New Hampshire insane asylum that published a series of articles that made Pavlik look like a choir boy. And after a series of news articles and legal proceedings, on December 13th, 1966, Pavlik was let go from the Concord insane asylum as a free man. Mr. Pavlik was eventually released took an apartment in, in the city of Manchester. During his years of incarceration, Pavlik's hatred of JFK may well have quelled, but it was to be replaced by a new figure of contempt. His one-time friend, Thomas Murphy, the postmaster, whom he discovered had been responsible for alerting the Secret Service to the bomb plot. Mr. Murphy had a number of children and uh, he was very concerned. Mr. Pavlik was saying, you know, I understand you got an award from the Postal Service for turning me in, and uh, one of these days I'll come and see you. And uh, this really concerned the, the postmaster. We drive to Belmont and park from the Murphy residence and uh, be staring at the house. He'd sit for hours on end parked outside the Murphy household, just watching the family come and go. There was no law at the time against stalking or harassment. So Pavlik's intimidating behavior was perfectly legal. It was very, uh, very terrifying to them. My husband felt his family was threatened. And I think that's probably why we didn't tell the girls too much about it. We didn't want to scare them. I recall when I was growing up, anytime I heard Pavlik's name, I would, I would be very afraid. I just thought he was really bad and he would, it would scare me when I'd hear his name. Richard Pavlik died on November 11th, 1975, aged 88. He may now just be a curious footnote in history, the man who could have killed JFK. But if he had succeeded, history may have taken a very different path. If JFK had been assassinated earlier by public, I think we would see some different decisions. I don't know how Johnson would have handled the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, whether he would have been even more belligerent. But there's no question that history would have been changed if the assassination had taken place but to those who knew Pavlik, both the man and his actions continue to leave a lasting mark on their lives. Well, I think he was an unfortunate soul, a very tortured soul, and I will remember him as such. And just very thankful that the postmaster uh, did do what he do and observed what he observed. I consider Dad a hero because he definitely could have saved the president's life. 
Definitely proud of my father. And if anyone is in any doubt that President Kennedy was grateful, they only need ask former state attorney Robert Rust, who has a very special memento. I got this within several months after the arrest of Pavlik. Uh, Mr. Robert Rust, with very best wishes, John F. Kennedy. Bless his heart. 